देखिए ना आज टुडे इज द इलेवेंथ विश्व मंथन सेशन इट्स इंटरेस्टिंग इज इंटेड नॉट ओनली फॉर प्रद्युम्न फॉर समीर फॉर नंदू जी फॉर मी बट आई गेस फॉर ऑल ऑफ यू बिकॉज दिस इज ट्रूली समथिंग विच वी ऑल स्टार्टेड टूगेदर आई जस्ट सी सुबोध ज्वाइनिंग इन वी ऑल जस्ट गॉट ऑन दिस जर्नी एंड देखते ही देखते ये कारवा अब ग्यारहवीं पायदान पे आ पहुंचा है इट्स रीच द इलेवेंथ स्टेप Amazing ten sessions we had. If you remember, we started. If I'm not mistaken, Samir on the third of May. So this has been a this has been a process of four months now, and uh, it's been wonder wonderful uh, wonderful uh, process. Process of self learning, self discovery, and as Pradyumna always says, a process of following our principles. And the principles are friendship, candor, and inclusiveness. so if you remember last time we had a nice discussion we started with having this session once every week we then did it twice a month which is once in two weeks and then taking all your feedback from all our friends now we are doing it once in three weeks this is this is what uh, the whole process is the process of uh, actually uh, it was samir who reminded me about this thank you samir for for doing that this week is very special it is special because as you all remember yesterday we had teachers day we all celebrated that i'm sure all of us wished uh, all our teachers or ye this process of learning of gaining knowledge never stops never ceases isn't it that's actually one of the reasons of uh, the honors rose of vishwamanthan ab aisa kaise ho sakta hai ki main itna sab bolu aur ek share na batau so i remember ki galib sahab the the so called legend the so called expert even he says ki rekhta ke tumhi ek ustad nahi galib rekhta ke tumhi ek ustad nahi galib kehte hai pichle zamane mein koi meer bhi tha so even he the legendary galib considers meer as his teacher we are blessed today to have a similar amazing teacher our guru who has joined us now this gentleman whom i will very soon introduce has been a teacher to also some of some of us he is for example he taught pradyumna if i am not mistaken he taught you pradyumna in barcelona a couple of years back i am Absolutely. referring exactly and uh, i am referring to uh, professor s ramakrishnan velamuri uh, we call him and i hope professor that's okay that, that i refer to you as also rama because i i believe that's how you like to be called um, yes you are the chengwai venture professor for entrepreneurship at the at the prestigious china european international business school seeps as we all call it where uh, professor rama teaches entrepreneurship innovation and negotiation bhai ye teen cheez agar aa jaye to life kitni easy ho jaye he has become from the university of padras mba from iese business school spain and phd as well from darwin school university of virginia he is a chair for strategy and entrepreneurship department at the seeps he was the academic director of seeps center for entrepreneurship and that's one of the uh, things we are going to talk to him about and learn from him and investment as well we are also going to speak to him about that from 2011 to 2015 the global executive mba from 2010 to 2012 and the global ceo program for latin america this is a program interestingly which seeps runs with wharton Uh, university uh, they do that in with in partnership with wharton school and the iese business school from 2009 to 2010 he has also served as a chair for the research committee and members of the facility evaluation committee he has pradyumna reminded me uh, when we were talking about professor rama that he has carried numerous case studies case developments and entrepreneurship facility uh, faculty development assignments for and this is very interesting for the world bank the international finance corporation and the national entrepreneurship network of india he teaches as a visiting professor at the indian school of business isb at the frankfurt school of finance and management and the bokini university he has been a facilitator in programs for senior managers at and hold your breath this michelin tencent china development bank air liquid roche evonix a uh, shandong gold bosch Buller, Unicef, Henkel Adhesives, Henkel का नाम सुना है, Abbott Laboratories, uh, Goodyear, Dunlop, Nissan, you name it. 
and he is he has been there so without further ado i welcome you professor rama to this lovely group of friends um, i will now hand it over to your own student to pradyumna to uh, to seek input from you and then i'm sure this will be an enlightening session for all of us welcome once again and thank you so much for joining thank you so much thank, for thank you thank you abed and uh, welcome again uh, professor rama uh, for this uh, uh, what i very very sure will be a very enriching session session for all of us and just a reminder for all our friends uh, on the call today if you have any questions uh, please put them into the chat and then uh, as we go through the session we'll try and cover them towards the end uh, professor rama uh, yesterday as uh, uh, amit mentioned was teachers day and all of us uh, know that uh, the role that teachers have played in our own lives uh, but you have had a unique uh, privilege and uh, uh, to shape so many students lives their leadership skills and uh, even by virtue of that shaped so many industries so many businesses so i, I wanted to uh, take you back and talk about what inspired you to take on uh, this path and become a teacher uh, to not only learn but also share your learnings and your wisdom with others uh, so thank you uh, pradyumna um, uh, before i answer that question uh, i will say that i am greatly honored to to be invited as a speaker to the vishwamanthan series um, i joined as a member as you all know uh, i have attended a few of your sessions um, mm -hmm. and um, when pradyumna approached me i in fact i attended uh, the sessions delivered by mr kamat and mr suresh prabhu and when pradyumna approached me i i grilled him i said do you do you really want me because uh, you know um, after having had the speakers of the stature of mr kamat and mr prabhu uh, it's going to be a, a you know a, a very steep fall in terms of uh, quality um and um, i'm not saying this uh, you know just to, just for the sake of saying it but i think if um, i can achieve just 1% of what uh, these uh, two two giants have achieved in their lives uh, i think uh, i would have been a very successful uh, professional um i have also had the the, uh, the pleasure of actually learning from from you from you all you know i have invited uh, amit uh, nandu uh, gajanan many of you to my classes to to share your wisdom with my students um and um i i was part of this uh, shanghai leadership forum in in shanghai and many of the members of uh, of vishwamanthana are actually from that from that group and um, the reason i found those uh, sessions so um, informative and enlightening was that i was interacting with people of your caliber right with the vast industry experience and um, i made it a point to actually continuously engage with people like you so that i can take your insights back to my classroom and um, add value to my to my students um so so my journey basically i'll 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 share it in in a very briefly uh, uh, so i was born in india i i we, we are the telugu speaking people uh, but uh, i spent the first 12 years of my life in dehradun um my father was uh, an officer in the ongc uh, oil and natural gas commission in fact he was one of the first six employees of uh, ongc so they they were sent on secondment from the geological survey of india to dehradun to set up what was in those days the oil and natural gas directorate okay so later became the oil and natural gas commission uh, and my father was in the team that uh, acquired the land where the headquarters of ongc sits today it's called tel bhavan um, and i spent the first 12 years of my life in dehradun um, Uh, so i did my primary and secondary schooling there and then my father got an opportunity to to go to nigeria to 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 teach there at the university he is a geologist and so um, we did, my parents decided that uh, uh, they they wanted us to continue our education in india so we moved to our family home in in chennai and i did my secondary schooling and and college uh, in chennai uh, then did my uh, uh mba from esa business school in spain 
uh, worked in industry for about six years uh, and then worked as a management consultant uh, for eight years. And the six years that I worked as in industry was mainly in Spain and the UK. Uh, I worked for a old economy company, uh, a lead acid battery manufacturer, and um, one of the largest in Europe. And then I uh, worked for eight years as a, as a consultant, self-employed consultant in the areas of uh, internationalization. So it was during these eight years that um, uh, as a self-employed consultant that I started uh, teaching part-time. Uh, and uh, the reason was really out of compulsion because uh, you know, when you're self-employed and you, and you don't have uh, the brand of uh, Anderson Consulting or a, or a, or a McKinsey, uh, then you have to hunt for your own contracts. And then when you get your contracts, you have to you know, work like crazy to, to actually ex deliver those contracts. So, uh, and um, you know, my expenses were very stable, but my income was you know, very volatile. And to get some predictability in my income stream, I started uh, teaching and my first assignment came on a, uh, uh, at the Boston University campus in Spain. They had opened a new campus and I wrote to the director and he invited me to deliver a course there. And that's how I started teaching. And as time went on, I became more, uh, I, I found that I enjoyed teaching a lot more than consulting. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do more teaching and less, less consulting. Um, and um, as you know, uh, the academic world doesn't take you seriously if you don't have a PhD. So we call the PhD the trade union certificate of the academics, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, and uh, you know, some I wrote to several schools, and they said we can let you teach, uh, you know, the odd course, but if you want to teach on an ongoing basis, you must have a PhD. So, by which time I was married, I was in my late thirties. I was married, and I had um, I had a daughter already. My my first daughter had been born, and so it was not an easy decision, you know. So after eight years of working as a consultant. Uh, and then I got some very good advice from my from my teacher, uh, Professor Paddy Miller, who passed away in 2018, the late Paddy Miller. And he said, Rama, I think you should do a full-time PhD, not a part-time PhD, which is what I was thinking of doing at that time. Uh, he said, because you have still a you know, long runway at, uh, in, uh, after you get your PhD. So uh, better to invest in a, in a high-quality PhD. And so uh, we went to the US. Uh, to the University of Virginia, which offered me a scholarship uh, and uh, uh, spent four years there. Uh, uh, during those four years, my second daughter was born. And um, I, I just wanted to share with you a couple of highlights of my, you know, my childhood, if, if I may. Uh, sure. I'm, very proud, I'm very proud of this and a childhood and I would say, you know, of my, of my life. And, and I would, uh, so the first one was actually, um, you know, this, this, is, um, this is a place, it's called Tara Devi, Tara Devi in Shimla, very, very close to Shimla. And uh, I, I, when I was 13 years old, I um, had the opportunity of representing Tamil Nadu uh, uh, in the National Integration Camp for Scouts uh, that was held in Tara Devi. So the Bharat Scouts and Guides has a, a camp in, in Tara Devi and, and teams came from all over India. And there were only six scouts selected from Tamil Nadu, and I was one of them. So that was a big uh, kind of a, uh, a big event in my life because uh, uh, to be selected was a big thing, and then to go to this camp and spend two weeks there, you know, with uh, with cadets from all over India, you know, um, interact with them. I met for the first time. I met people from Nagaland. You know, it was amazing. Uh, and uh, that experience was very enriching, and uh, it, it gave me also a lot of confidence as a youngster. So that is one of, one of the high points of my, of my very young life. The other, uh, I will ask you, this is a quiz, you know. So this is me here. Uh, but we are in a very, very famous venue. So this is a, a you know, a, I want to test your general knowledge. Uh, can you tell me which, what is the venue that we are at? Can anybody tell me what, what's the venue we're at? Uh, it's still in Shamla? No. no. This is not in oh, India. It's not in India. 
now we give up. Professor. This is very meaningful for people from uh, boys, especially I, I, from India. Yeah, tell so me. I, there's an Oxford University is one of the guesses, and there is another uh, guess is the Lords. Yeah, the second one is right, uh, Pradyumna. So this is the Lords Cricket Ground, and um, this is in June of 1992. Uh, I was 30 years old then, and this is the Spanish national cricket team. Okay. Wow. Uh, now, now you must be thinking. You must be thinking. Uh, wait a minute. You know, does Spain have a cricket team? Actually, Spain does have a cricket team. Uh, it's um, a member of the uh, International Cricket Council. Uh, it, it was an affiliate member at that time. And there was a tournament held in England in a, in a town called Worksop for all the affiliate members of the, there were 10 nations that participated in this tournament. You know, Spain was one, Germany, France, Luxembourg, Belgium, Italy, and so on, Portugal. And um, at the end of the tournament, the winner of the tournament, which in this case was Germany, they would get a they would get an opportunity to play against MCC at the Lords, wow. and um, and all the other teams were invited to attend the match. Okay, so uh, I've actually been to Lords Cricket Ground, uh, unfortunately not as a player, uh, but um, but I've actually visited the dressing rooms and so on. And so this was another very high point in my life. This is June of. Uh, June of 1992. Okay, uh, I just thought oh. I would uh, throw that in. I was um, so this uh, the gentleman standing next to me, the tall gentleman. He's uh, British. He uh, captained the uh, Essex under 18 team. Uh, so there were some oh, decent okay. cricketers in our, in our side, and Germany had um, the nephew of uh, Patawi playing in playing for them, and they had a couple of uh, former first class cricketers from Pakistan playing for them. So that's why they won the tournament. Uh, but uh, so this was a, another very very wonderful experience for me. So I thought I'll I would just uh, share that with you as anecdotes uh, about my life journey. And then yes, and then I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait. For, so you asked me. Uh, I think I've answered your question about what brought me to academia. Uh, so it was basically you know out of compulsion in, uh, during my consulting days I started uh, teaching, and then I realized that I really enjoyed it. Uh, so I've been teaching now for about 27 years full time for about 17 years and um, associated with two mainly with two institutions one is ESA business school in Spain for four years and then with CIBS China Europe International Business School now for 13 years and that have taught at various places as a visiting professor as it uh, so kindly mentioned yes so professor thank you and I think it was a uh, uh, in, in the blessing in disguise that you had that uh, compulsion, uh, blessing for all of us, uh, uh, students of yours and so many other students. And I think just in the first reply, there are so many uh, facets of yours uh, that we got to learn. There are so many things that we can take away already. Uh, I think to uh, start it off, uh, the humility, uh, as you mentioned, when I approached you with which you asked me that question or grilled me, as you said, uh, and I always, uh, and if you recall, and I still stand by that, that uh, having you on this forum will only make our forum, our platform uh, shine even brighter. So thank you for, uh, for that. The way you pursued your passion, uh, even uh, not to achieve uh, what you wanted to achieve and doing a PhD uh, when you already have uh, started a family and uh, you know, making that commitment, I think was superb. And I didn't know about your cricketing skills, so that that is also <laughs> wonderful. So, Professor Rama, we all, uh, as they say, that guru, uh, not only as a teacher but also as a mentor, makes a big difference in our lives. Uh, who you would say are the mentors or teachers who have made a big influence in your your life? Who are the role models uh, at different stages, uh, especially when you since you started to uh, teach? that have influenced you and uh, shaped the way you would look at life and uh, your values are, are shaped by them? I think there have been, I've had some great teachers, right? I think um, uh, in India, in school, I've had some really wonderful teachers. Uh, I had a math teacher in, uh, in my high school in Chennai. Uh, his name is uh, Mr. Vardakutti and uh, uh, very, very, uh, wonderful, wonderful math teacher, very passionate 
uh, very strict disciplinarian, made you work really hard, set very high standards, but uh, very effective teacher. And I think not just me, but everybody who's been through that school. He was a legend, actually, in my school. And um, many of his students have gone, gone on to achieve some great things in life. So he was one. Um, in my college, I had some uh, wonderful teachers, uh, in, uh, especially for accounting and so on. Uh, I did, as, I, as you know, I did my BCom. Um, but the, the people who actually shaped my career in, in very, very important ways, the first one I would say was uh, Professor Paddy Miller, who passed away uh, in 2018, uh, uh, tragically. Uh, then uh, two other professors, uh, one was um, Richard Funkhauser. Uh, he gave me my very first uh, opportunity uh, as a teacher. And he was the director of Boston University in Saragossa, an American economist. He's an economist. And um, the interview itself that he conducted with me when he invited me to meet him was uh, very different from a corporate interview. You know, it was, uh, you know, very relaxed, but it was at the same time very thorough, you know. Uh, there was never a, a, a moment when I thought that I was being interrogated, you know. So it was more like a conversation of equals. Um, and uh, he presented to me at that time, you know, uh, the, uh, the very, I would say, the very nice face of academia. And uh, just by meeting him, I said, you know, uh, wow, I would, like to, I would like to teach in this institution. So he was the second one. And then my the third very important influence in my life is um, uh, Professor Venkatraman, who was my thesis advisor at the University of Virginia. Uh, and um, once again, you know, as I said to you, I joined my PhD program at the age of 37 uh, with significant corporate and consulting experience with some teaching experience. And he treated us as equals, you know, or not just me, but all the doctoral students in my cohort, we were treated like equals. And um, uh, and that he and and the other members of my committee, uh, one of them is uh, his name is Richard uh, Ed, Edward Freeman, Edward Freeman, who is considered to be the father of uh, stakeholder theory. Uh, so these are people who, just by their behaviors, they inspire, you know. Um, uh, you don't uh, you necessarily learn the most from what they tell you, but you learn the most from observing how they carry themselves, you know, both as uh, academics and as human beings. And right. um, very uh, humble uh, people and very uh, down to earth, very approachable. Um, you know, so, so that was, uh, that was uh, I would say those, those were the people who uh, come to mind, you know, immediately, but there were many more obviously. Excellent. Uh, Professor Rama, let's talk about SEEDS. I think as you mentioned, China Europe Business School is where you have, you are currently associated and have spent uh, uh, the longest uh, part of your teaching uh, experience has been at SEEDS. Uh, and all of us have seen, or most of us have seen SEEDS in some uh, ways, either we have uh, attended some programs there or have visited there. What, what, in your uh, uh, opinion makes uh, the school so special in such a short time or relatively short time it has become one of the top institutes globally uh, and Gajanan also actually posted that as a question while there are many institutes for example in India or other parts of the world they have not come to the same recognition uh, or rank that uh, they've they not been able to achieve. Okay so uh, basically I would say that uh, at CIBS once again you know the leaders of my school, um, I have always uh, heard them attribute uh, a very important part of the school's success to being in the right place at the right time. Okay, uh, again, there's 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 humility, right? So so basically, uh, of course, the the school leadership managed the school very very well, and I'll come to that in a minute. But we were carried by a massive wave, which was the uh, Chinese economic miracle. So we were like surfers who benefited from a massive wave, okay? Uh, the school uh, started in 1994, and you know what happened after 1994, 
practically 10% uh, uh, GDP growth for, until 2010. Uh, in a country that had, uh, before they didn't have any concept of management education, they only had uh, economics departments in universities, right? And so the demand for, uh, you know, educating managers was immense. And uh, so we benefited from this demand. Um, CIBS is without a doubt the most successful a joint venture in higher education in China. Without a doubt, it is the most successful joint venture. And it's a joint venture between the Chinese government and the European Union. Okay. Uh, so I would say that the, the, the reasons for the success, if you take the, again, the, the big chunk is the context, you know, the, the Chinese context, we were at the right place at the right time. The second reason I would say is that we have always benchmarked ourselves against the best schools in the world. Okay, we have not benchmarked ourselves against the other Chinese institutions. We've said, who are the best schools in the world? Who, we go to compare ourselves with Harvard, we compare ourselves with the University of Michigan, with Stanford University, with MIT, with INSEAD, right? We, we, so, and how do we do that? Uh, so we, one of, one of the mechanisms through which we learned how to run programs was we conducted joint programs with these schools. You know, I think Amit mentioned in the introduction that uh, uh, I was the academic director of a school that, of a program that we ran with the Wharton and ESA Business School. And the objective of these programs was uh, for the faculty members and for the staff of our school to learn how top quality institutions run their programs, okay? Uh, because uh, we were, because by virtue of being uh, the first, almost the first school to offer management education in China, we were getting some exceptionally highly qualified people into our programs. So I remember a in, my, in my first uh, year in China, uh, in my first EMBA class, when I used to finish my class at the end of the day and walk out of the gate, I would see limousines waiting, waiting outside with drivers, you know. And those limousines were actually waiting to, to pick up my, my students and take them home, right? Uh, so I've, many of my students have been uh, CEOs or chairman of the boards of companies with 15,000, 20,000 people, you know. Um, and uh, that is again the, the success of the school in its ability to attract these people. Uh, it puts an enormous amount of pressure on us uh, because uh, we have to, uh, you know, every minute that we deliver content in the class, we have to make it relevant for these practicing managers. So if you if you make your content too theoretical, they, they get really nervous. <clears throat> they want something that they can start using the next day at their workplace, right? And then, so that puts a lot of pressure on us. But um, so, so this benchmarking was uh, one thing that uh, we did. And then by and large, we have hired uh, uh, PhDs who were trained outside China. Um, so I don't think we have a single PhD um, who was trained in, in mainland China. So, so that, that's, been, that's been another, uh, uh, and it's not for, not, not for any, any other reason, but to, but to say that at the time when we, when we were growing, the PhD programs in China, we didn't think they were of sufficient quality. And so, so most of our PhD uh, faculties, uh, faculty members have been, many of them, most of them are actually ethnic Chinese, about two thirds of them but they've been trained in the US, Canada, Europe, right. Southeast Asia. So, right. so, so these are uh, some of the ingredients of our success. Yeah. Fantastic. <clears throat> now, th this is good and I have experience uh, firsthand uh, attending some of the programs, the quality uh, of uh, teaching at, at uh, uh, SEEPS. Uh, we'll, and we'll come back to uh, this, but let's now uh, talk about the key topic that we uh, also wanted to get more insights from you. Uh, and we wanted to, you have seen now uh, you, startups, innovations, uh, the manufacturing. You recently wrote a wonderful article about uh, the manufacturing and innovation. Uh, how can we boost it in India? But before we talk about India, can you share with us what do successful countries do differently uh, when the countries who are able to succeed in creating more startups, giving more space to innovation, uh, to create a, an ecosystem which uh, uh, provides manufacturing industries uh, the, the right kind of ecosystem. What do they do different and well? What are some of the best practices? 
I would say that, um, you know, as far as country policies are concerned, uh, you know, as long as the governments can stay out of the way, you know, uh, I think that's good enough because uh, the, the forces, I would say, the technological forces uh, are very, very strong globally. Okay, they, they, they go beyond a single country. And uh, let me explain to you what I mean by that. So if you look at, um, uh, you know, uh, let me share with you some. Uh, so this, for example, is one, one of the technological trends that, that you can see, right? So you see the cost of technology basically is dropping dramatically. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and costs that were earlier fixed costs, are now becoming variable costs. So earlier, a, co a company that needed to invest in servers doesn't need to invest in servers anymore. Earlier, a, com the, a company that needed to pay a hefty license upfront for the use of a software doesn't need to do so anymore, you know, because of the SAS software as a service model. You have contract manufacturing, you have contract warehousing, you have contract distribution, right? So, so most startups today can actually function with variable costs, that's one big trend. <coughs> the second big trend is you have a lot of money that is looking to for in, for uh, high returns, basically, right? So you have angel networks in in most cities in the world. You know, people have money that they a part of which they want to invest in in in, in angel networks. You have um, institutions. Uh, you know, willing to invest as limited partners in venture capital and private equity funds. Okay, so there's a, a huge amount of finance available now for startups. Um, the support ecosystem has also dramatically improved, right? So every university today has an incubator, every, you know, corporate has an incubator, you know, BMW, I'm sure Henkel has its own incubator. So, so Big corporations have their own incubators because they realize that uh, they need to engage with startups, right? So today, a large corporation like Henkel or Johnson & Johnson or IBM, they know that internal development of R&D, of, of invention is no longer sufficient. Uh, they need some, some mechanisms to pull in, you know, innovation from small companies. And today, the, the major locus of innovation actually is small companies, right? Um, and how do, how do they do that? So they have multiple mechanisms. One is, one is incubators. Another is uh, taking minority stakes in, in young companies. Right? It's called corporate venture capital. Um, if they see a very strong strategic fit between what the startup is doing and what they're doing, outright acquisition, right? So multiple me mechanisms. So there are multiple tools available for you to do this. And for me, I think one of the most exciting trends is that, you know, because of the emergence of these new technologies, um, having a history in, in these industries is no longer important. So just take, for example, in India, you know, if you wanted to set up a business in the chemical industry, you as, a, as an independent entrepreneur, if you come from a non-business family, if you come from a family of professionals, you would be at a disadvantage with respect to somebody who came from a business family because everything is new, right? And here, these industry, in these industries, in order to be successful, you need to have the right knowledge and the capacity for hard work. So social networks are not important. Capital is not important, as I just pointed out. So that is bringing in a number of youngsters from non-business families into entrepreneurship. So entrepreneurship has been democratized, right? All over the world, not just in India. You see that in India also in a very, very big way, right? Uh, but all over the world, and I would say maybe one last factor is you have role models, right? In India, you have people like Narayan Murthy, who came from a non-business family and made it big. In China, you have Jack Ma, you know, who uh, was an English teacher who made it big, right? So you have many, many, many such role models. 
who are uh, galvanizing the youngsters to do something on their own, right? So I think these these are some of the trends that we see. Government policy, I'd say, I say is important, but I think is important in terms of removing barriers more than in terms of creating the support uh, system, right? I think making taxation uh, more uh, rational for uh, investors, for example, right? That kind of thing. Um, we had a situation, I think, a couple of years back in India where uh, uh, a startup w w was not able to pay its supplier on time and the, the supplier, I think, filed a police case and, and they, the police actually arrested the entrepreneur. So these are situations that we need to avoid, basically, right? Uh, so we need to give some room for the entrepreneurs to, to innovate, to fail, to try again. You know, bankruptcy laws are important, for example, right? Allowing people to come, get back on their feet after they failed once. So these are some of the things that the governments can do. But I think the wave is, is a very powerful wave. And I don't think it's specific to any country, right? Right. So, Professor Rama, I think with all these uh, positives, and as you mentioned, not uh, for any one country, but globally are uh, very powerful trends, right? Uh, why, what is the reason that we don't see so many large, successful global players coming out of India that as we see in past, always from the Western world, uh, from the US, uh, for example, and now increasingly from China or even from uh, other nations, uh, other emerging nations? Why? What is it that we are missing uh, to capitalize on these trends? I would say um, there are, I think there are various parts to your question. The first one is that um, uh, China has created uh, a kind of a, a technology space, right, which is very China specific. I think we all know that um, uh, they have, um, in some ways, nurtured their own technology champions, right? Uh, more so in some areas than in others. Maybe uh, Baidu has received a lot of support from the government in the sense that, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in the sense that uh, Google uh, has not um, has decided not to comply with the. Uh, conditions laid down by the Chinese government. Uh, uh, then Facebook has not been allowed to operate in China at all. Um, and when it comes to the e-commerce companies, maybe through their own mistakes, I would say, rather than through any uh, support given to the Chinese companies, they have also not been able to be successful. So the result is that China has its own technology ecosystem. Okay. Uh, that has, I think, positives and negatives. Um, it has positives in the sense that because China is a very, very big market and China has adopted technology very aggressively, okay, uh, these companies have been able to achieve massive scale by focusing mainly on the Chinese market. Okay, so that's a positive. The negative is that uh, the geographic footprint of uh, these tech giants from China outside mainland China is very, very limited. With the exception of TikTok, right? There is no ma major Chinese technology player. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the hardware manufacturers like Huawei. Huawei and the mo uh, mobile phone manufacturers, they have, uh, they have achieved uh, success outside China. But I'm saying from pure technology players, they have not been able to replicate their success outside China. And they've mainly tried to do that through investments, right? Like Alibaba and Tencent and so on. So I think um, India has, uh, one way of looking at it is to say that India has followed a different strategy. But I would say that India's approach has been characterized by a lack of strategy. I don't think anybody in Delhi has been thinking about this at all. And so, we have just drifted into a situation where the Indian market has been open for everybody, right, until now. And uh, today, the, you know, the biggest search engine in, in India is Google. The biggest uh, social uh, apps are Facebook and uh, WhatsApp. And the biggest uh, e-commerce companies are owned by Amazon and Walmart, right? So, but, but I think 
the, 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 this is a marathon. This is not a, this is not a hundred meter sprint, right? Uh, the, the advantage of that is that the Indian startup ecosystem is much more connected to the global uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem, right? So you see a large number of Indian companies that actually have successfully expanded outside India. Okay, so we have to wait and see how this plays out. But I don't think that um, the Chinese approach has its has its advantages. But I don't think uh, there there are all advantages. There are also some disadvantages. And the Indian approach has its disadvantages, but there are also some advantages. Right. So that's one part of why uh, China's China has been able to produce large companies. The second reason I would say is that. I've noticed in Chinese entrepreneurs, and I'm sure you've noticed this too, this hunger for scale is something that you don't see in India, right? A Chinese entrepreneur wants to become the biggest in the world and wants to list or wanted to, at least until now, until the trouble started between China and the US, wanted to list in New York. That was their dream, okay? Wanted to have an IPO in New York. Um, and their desire for growth seems to be insatiable. Whereas what I see amongst many Indian entrepreneurs is that once they reach a certain scale, uh, contentment sets in, right? Contentment and saying, both ho gaya, ye kafi hai, right? And then they turn to spirituality maybe or, or community service or something like that. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, by the way. Okay, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, you know, putting some some facts on the table as I observe them, right? Um, I would say, with the exception of maybe the Ambani's, you know, uh, who who have that, you know, that uh, characteristic that you see in uh, in China, that hunger for growth, you don't see that as much in uh, in India. I would say that's that's a uh, second uh, important reason. And third, I think. Um, the Chinese government has also pushed the, the Chinese companies to, to scale, right? And I think uh, that has also helped them quite a bit. Both, I'm saying both the private enterprises and state-owned enterprises to, to, to upgrade their technologies, to scale, uh, you know, some of the things, some of the support mechanisms that they have in place for their companies are just amazing. Yeah. So, so I would, I would uh, three parts to, you, to your question. Answer to your question. Fantastic. No, and very insightful, uh, Professor Rama. Uh, and again, we all know that India has some unique advantages uh, as a country as well. We have a very large domestic demand. We have a big demographic dividend. Um, we overall we have a massive opportunity. And I think besides the technology space that we discussed just now, both for China, India, but other countries as well, we know that for India to generate employment broad-based employment, uh, we need to have a big manufacturing base. I mean, that's what in the end will create a lot of uh, jobs for blue-collar blue workers and will make sure that we are strong as a com country and uh, gives strength to our GDP and we, have become, we become Atmanirbhar as we want to become. What should we do to accelerate in the manufacturing space? So, yeah. Um... So the, so the truth of the matter is that uh, our uh, manufacturing footprint is tiny. As I said in my Outlook article, we have about uh, roughly 18% of the global population. India has 18% of the global population. About 7.75% of the global GDP. But only 3% of the global manufacturing output. Okay. So... Um, where is the where is the problem, right? So so I think um, I have always been saying that our infrastructure is not good, okay. And we all have been saying that. I think especially those of us who lived in China, you know, we instinctively we compare China and India, and we say China's infrastructure is so great and India is so poor. And in December of last year, in December 2019, uh, I brought a group of Chinese students to India. And my colleague, who is an economist, uh, Chu Tian, uh, he came with me, okay? And he was visiting India for the first time, okay? He's a brilliant economist, very deeply knowledgeable about the Chinese economy. And he came to India, and he was very impressed by what he saw in India. He spent a week in Mumbai and uh, Bangalore. 
and at the end of the week he he he's very insightful as i said and he he posed a very thought provoking question to me okay he said rama you keep saying and i've heard many people during our visit here say that india's infrastructure is deficient but um, i think india has the best infrastructure of any country that has a gdp of around 2000 gdp per capita of 2000 dollars uh why are you always comparing yourself with china china's gdp is five times higher right it's in the, in the region of 10000 but if you compare yourself so as you know the world bank has four classifications you know of high income countries upper middle income countries lower middle income countries and low income countries so china is an upper middle income country india is a lower middle income country okay and uh, jutian is actually right because i then looked up some some studies and uh, they have what are called infrastructure indices for countries and based on these infrastructure indices uh, india is the best position of all the lower middle income countries on infrastructure okay so so this is very thought provoking okay so so then I, yeah go ahead can i it, i think sometimes it's the cause and the effect right are we saying that we should be happy that we are uh, a top amongst uh, the 2000 dollar uh, per capita income countries or is the, we are in that uh, level because we don't have a good infrastructure that's let why me, we are 2000 ah, so so that's that's a, that's another very insightful question prajumna so let me uh, answer that in the following way so i have another friend who says to me rama you keep saying that infrastructure is deficient in india uh bangladesh's infrastructure is much poorer than india's how is it that in textiles they have achieved so much more than we have if you look at the textile exports of bangladesh they are significantly more than india's vietnam on the on the infrastructure index vietnam is also in the lower middle income category same as india and its infrastructure is inferior to india's yet uh vietnam has achieved miracles in manufacturing whereas india has not right so this these questions actually have made me think a little more about uh, why india has not been successful so one is the infrastructure story right the other is i think an ineffective policy story ineffective policies in the sense that in india you know a lot of um, central government initiative policies don't get translated to the to the ground because of some resistance in the states right so this is called the political economy of center state relations right so right. so whereas in in china i think their ability to translate their policies into into action you know maybe there's only a 5% dilution so if they they want 100% they may get 95 in india if we want 100% we may get only 30 right because of all the you know the the distortion that takes place in between so could that be the reason why you know we don't have a uh, a strong industry so i'm i'm just posing these questions to you because many of you are in the in the manufacturing industry uh you see how manufacturing companies are operate in in china and in india and i think many of you like nandu for example has managed uh, manufacturing units in both countries jagdish acharya I, i saw him you know in the in this thing he has manufactured He has managed manufacturing units in both countries. So there are many, many of you who've done that. Ashwin Bondal, who is here, he he also has done that. So, so I think yes, infrastructure we can improve. You know, we I think it's good for us to, as I said, benchmark ourselves with the with the Chinese. Uh, but I think the policy angle is is another thing that we need to pay attention to very carefully because uh, I think a lot of uh, a lot of our failure right our labor laws for example right i mean we've been saying for a long time that we need to make labor more flexible but we made labor flexible in a very uh, in a very unsatisfactory way right by having contract laborers so so we have two classes of laborers we have one class of laborer the tiny class you know which maybe represents 10% of the the total labor force which we call the organized labor force right that has all the protections in the world and then you have 90% of the labor force that has no protection right and i think 
you know, if we were, could move to a middle ground where perhaps, you know, th these people who have unnecessarily high protection, which is imposing a huge cost on, on companies, if some of that protection can be diluted and labor markets could be made more flexible, some of the people who are the, the migrant laborers whom we saw in, you know, in the last couple of months, the suffering that they went through, if their, you know, protections could be improved, social protection could be improved, I think we would be in a much better place. Uh, in yeah, no, I, and I think bo both are very important uh, uh, topics, uh, the infrastructure as well as the governance. And I think the good thing is, as you also highlighted, Professor Rama, uh, in your article, and we are seeing that over the last uh, several years, uh, we are seeing an improvement on both counts. We can all argue and debate that, is it enough or is it fast enough? But there has been a steady improvement and even acceleration in the infrastructure. Uh, the policies are, are getting uh, better and simpler and uh, we are climbing the ladder in the ease of doing business. Uh, my question is, now with Corona, we have uh, been dealt a hammer blow. The economy has obviously got a setback, not only just in India, but around the world. How we can even accelerate on these uh, areas of governance and infrastructure to use this, uh, this shock, uh, this apada, and to convert that into an ausar an opportunity for us so that we can actually use this uh, uh, as, as a benefit to us or uh, use it as an opportunity for, uh, for, for our economy and country. I think uh, from what I have uh, read in the last uh, few months, um, this government has uh, used this opportunity to introduce some medium to long term changes, I think. Um, and um, one of them is obviously um, a much greater focus on um, Make in India. I think that Make in India now gets um, maybe goes into a 2.0 with the Atmanirbhar campaign, right? Certainly, there are certain critical areas where we don't want to depend on outside suppliers, such as pharmaceutical ingredients is one, personal protective equipment is the other. And I think very importantly, the defense area I think there has already been for the last six, seven, eight years a drive to to, to bring manufacturing, you know, inside India. Um, and then, of course, the uh, uh, freeing up of the agricultural market is another very, very big, uh, very, very big uh, medium move that will have a medium-term impact. Um, and I think the one silver lining in this COVID. Uh, pandemic is is the agriculture sector i think if the exactly. agriculture sector comes out of this you know um, healthier uh, that could add maybe a one percentage point one and a half percentage points of additional gdp growth to india what i have not seen uh, until now and i've been very disappointed is that there's not been any major uh, uh, you know measure to stimulate demand Okay, uh, and I think uh, until that happens, you know, until consumers start spending more, right, uh, the, the path to recovery is going to be, uh, in my view, more difficult. Uh, I'm also hearing from uh, small and medium enterprises that many of the uh, facilities that the government announced, uh, such as, for example, I think, uh, they could automatically get 20% of their outstanding uh, loans that were outstanding as of April 2020, 20% uh, in, in new loans from the bank. On the ground, getting these loans actually uh, from the banks has is proving to be much more difficult in reality uh, than what uh, was anticipated. So my fear is that a lot of the policy measures that are being announced at the central government level you know, especially on the uh, financing of uh, SMEs uh, are not getting translated into action. And I think uh, between the finance ministry and the RBI, they really need, need to take a closer look at this and, and figure out why that's not happening. Yeah. Right. And Professor Lama, that's a very important point uh, to stimulate demand. And I think uh, that uh, unless we, the government is able to do that or as a country we are able to do that, Obviously, these measures will only are only enablers. Right? They are not going to uh, be be able to be sufficient. Uh, how? What can the government do to stimulate demand, especially in the, in the current situation? I think they have to put money 
uh, into people's hands, right? I, I think, um, um, see, all the major countries of the world, um, when they have announced their stimulus packages, they have not been concerned about fiscal deficits. This is not the time to worry about fiscal deficits, right? And so, so to me, it seems that um, this government has um, an excessive uh, worry about uh, fiscal deficit. And at this time, in these extraordinary circumstances, you need to throw caution to the wind to a certain extent on the fiscal deficit. Uh, you know, fiscal deficit will expand. Um, but really, you need to be much more generous in, you know, maybe uh, direct transfers to, to, to migrant laborers. Many economists have been advocating that, right? Uh, Raghuram Rajan and others. Uh, so that they start consuming more. Um, income tax breaks, you know, for, uh, for people who pay income tax. So these are the kinds of things that I was talking about, so that uh, demand starts picking up again. Because um, if, you, if you offer stimulus to the supply side, they will not take up the stimulus if they don't see. You know, they, for example, you know, if you're um, giving SOPs to, to companies to expand capacity, they're not going to expand capacity if they don't see demand going up. So I think we need uh, demand stimulation first, and then those supply side measures will start uh, taking place. Absolutely. And I think these are the times when the government doesn't need to worry about inflation too much when they give, uh, they put money uh, or even print money to give it to yes. uh, people because, I mean, this is where there's no demand. Uh, so, Professor Rama, we also have some uh, wonderful questions already on the screen. Uh, and we are just a couple of minutes uh, away from our scheduled um, uh, stop. But if you're okay, we can extend the session by another 15 minutes. So why don't I ask Amit, who's uh, been actually curating the questions for us to actually take us through, and many of those are relating to what we are talking about. Amit, uh, can you take us through some of the key questions? I know there are a lot of them, and maybe we are not able to take all of them in 15 minutes. But why don't you take us through uh, some of the key questions that we see from our friends? Amit, are you on mute? Yeah, Pratt. I was I was on mute, uh, but but Samir has has managed to, to unmute me. So thanks, Samir, for that. Uh, Professor Rama, indeed, there are some very very interesting questions that have come in, uh, and also and because I think there is so much of love that people have, there are also some very interesting comments. Let me first start with the questions because those would be something more important. Uh, your good friend Gajanan Gandhe has a very interesting question, which I think is also very true for a lot of us who probably are looking at that. His question is, many industry experts after a long career feel that it is a cakewalk to walk into a university and start teaching. Unfortunately, it is not so. Can you provide some requirements and basics that one should keep before jumping into a teaching arena post their industrial career? Um, so I always joke, you know, all my friends who are in uh, corporate careers, they say, uh, they say to me, you know, um, we want to get out of this high pressure rat race, which is the corporate life. And now we want to start teaching. Um, so uh, I think uh, the first thing to realize is that there are lots of CVs that we receive from uh, experienced industry people uh, wanting to uh, do some teaching, right? And so um, currently, um, especially more so for perhaps in Europe, uh, there are lots of people who have uh, been laid off and uh, downsizing and so on. And so uh, they, they, they are looking at part-time or full-time teaching office. That's one, one thing that I, that I see. Uh, the second thing that I, that I see is that uh, universities and business schools are becoming more demanding when it comes to PhDs. So if you don't have a PhD, teaching on a regular basis is not easy. But you can, I think uh, Jayant and uh, Jagdish, uh, uh, Jagdish Acharya and Jayant Shikande, they've been uh, teaching very successfully. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, my, my, my approach would be to um, uh, say, to, say to you, uh, your industry knowledge is very, very important. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but remember that you may have had 30 or 40 years of experience. Let's say Pradyumna probably now has had 20 years of experience and you, Amit, you also in the um, 
in the fragrances industry, if I'm not mistaken, right? Similar, yeah, similar, similar. Yeah, yeah it's chemical, chemical area, right? So you have yes. been in chemicals for 20 years, and so you have deep knowledge of the chemical industry. So what we uh, notice sometimes that industry experts do is that their stories in the classroom always revol revolve around their own industries. You know, mm -hmm. I once had a yes. teacher who had many years of experience in uh, fast moving consumer goods and in, especially in soaps. And all his uh, examples were from the personal care industry, mm. right? And so I think uh, what I would suggest to you is that uh, your uh, industry knowledge is definitely very, very valuable and it's going to be viewed very positively by your students, but you need to broaden your, you know, your, your broaden your base of examples, right? That, that's Correct. the first thing. Second thing is, you know, uh, if you're going to teach any subject, you know, if you're teaching operations or marketing or whatever, get hold of a very, very good textbook. If you're teaching it at the business school level, you know, find out what some of the top business schools are using as textbooks or get, the course materials of that subject from a top business school, okay? Go through the readings and you will have then the, the knowledge. So you will be able to slot your knowledge into that structure, which is very, very important for that course. So remember, you, you know, if you're teaching a, a 30 hour course, you may need to deliver 15 sessions of 90 minutes each, right? Um, there's only so many stories that you can tell, right? So, so you need now a conceptual grounding for what you want to teach, and that that textbook is going to provide for you, right? It'll, it'll it'll tell you what topics to cover, in what sequence to cover them, right? And what are the frameworks that you can use to illustrate, you know, the knowledge that you want to illustrate, right? Sometimes you you've acquired some very very valuable knowledge by being on the battlefield, right? But if you can if you can organize that knowledge into a two by two framework, for example, that's very powerful. Okay? So the textbook and some of these readings, Harvard Business Review, MIT Sloan Review, they'll be able to give you the, those frameworks into which you can slot your knowledge, right? And so if you combine then your industry knowledge with this academic structure, you know you you're going to come out a winner. And uh, I would say that if you feel up to it, I think Vidhu Sharma has done it already. Uh, or he is doing it, if I'm not mistaken, um, is, you know, he's very young. I mean, he's, I, I think he's still maybe in his uh, late 40s. So he uh, has decided to invest in a, in a PhD, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so then, you know, with his uh, vast experience in HR, um, he has a PhD now. He's going to be very attractive for a business school. Okay. Right? Because he has the conceptual knowledge as well as that, you know, he's actually hired people, he's onboarded them, he's, you know, decided on compensation structures and everything. And, and so, so that's, that's very, very valuable, right? So I would say you need to marry your practical experience with that conceptual knowledge. I think that's very, very important. No, that's a, that's a very, very good question. And, and you've, you've really given some very apt examples. Uh, I will quickly go through the questions. I also realized- I'm, I'm that happy, happy to help you. Any of you who want to uh, do that, you know, uh, Check with me because I have access to all the course materials, Harvard course materials. I can get them for you, you know, without any problems. If you want an operations management course material or a marketing management course material, I can get you. I can tell you which textbook to buy and so on and so forth. Right? I can consult with my colleagues and I can give you those tips. That is that is so wonderful, uh, Professor. And and of course, uh, this is this is something which is really the hallmark of uh, Vishwamanthan. This friendship that we all uh, have and and we cherish that. I will go through the quick uh, list of questions. Uh, I realize that you may have answered some of them. My only su submission would be that if you feel that there is something more that you would like to add to it, then please do that. Uh, the follow-up question from Mr. Gandhi is, how does an institute like SEEBS get to the top 10 global management schools and places like IMA are far behind? What is lacking in our institutions given that even IITs don't figure in the top 100 worldwide? So the, the desire for learning that I see in China, mm -hmm. unfortunately, I don't see in India. So, so what has happened, I think, with IIMs is that IIMs became uh, leaders in India. Okay, uh, they, Their selectivity is amazing. 
you know, it's much more difficult to get into IIM Ahmedabad than probably to get into Harvard, right? So they attract the brainiest of students, okay? okay. Um, but unfortunately, uh, they have not, their research has not been, they have not benchmarked their research output to the best research, research schools in the world. Mm. Okay, so they are far behind when it comes to research. The only IIM that has now started to, to get its act together is IIM Bangalore. IIM Bangalore has, has made a very firm commitment to research under um, uh, Pankaj Chandra. Pankaj Chandra, the former director, mm. uh, who's now at Ahmedabad University. Uh, so, so that is one I would say. Uh, the second thing is, as I said, you know, this, this um, uh, you know, being the unquestionable number one in India has maybe uh, made them a little bit complacent, you know. Mm. And, um, and the third thing I think, which has not helped in my view, is that uh, for tactical reasons, they decided to name their MBA uh, PGDM. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, one of the things that we uh, pride ourselves on is that we are able to attract students from all over the world. We attract Americans, Europeans, Indians. We attract 10 to 15 Indians every year, Koreans, you know, uh, Latin Americans, Africans, and so on. So imagine that a, an American wants to come and study in India, right? Um, and he says, I want, to, I want to do an MBA, okay? And then you say that uh, here's the best business school in the world, and uh, the degree is not called an MBA, it's called a PGDM. So he says, what's that, you know? <laughs> and you say, uh, it's, it's actually equal to an MBA. Uh, so if he, the guy says, if it's equal to an MBA, why don't you call it an MBA? Right. So I've had uh, applications from FPM graduates, you know, fellow program in management, which is the equivalent of a PhD. We received applications at CIBS and I was earlier a member of the screening committee. Now I'm the department head, but earlier I was a member of the screening committee. We received some applications and my colleagues on the committee, they said, uh, this guy doesn't have a PhD. And I said, well, he has an FPM, which is equivalent to a PhD. And my same question. Why don't they call it a PhD then? Right? Correct. So, 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 so we Indians, I think, uh, I hate to say this, but we are really experts at shooting ourselves in the foot. You know, we make it more difficult. We make it more difficult for ourselves by by coming up with these clever schemes, because if you don't fall in line with global standards, you know, you can't achieve global standards. And one of the things that CIB has done, and I'm, you'd be surprised, uh, Amit. Uh, mm -hmm. Tsinghua is, is Tsinghua is the same thing, okay? The only school in India that has that has from the very day one decided to benchmark itself against global standards is ISP, the Indian School of Business. They intentionally decided not to get AICT certification. Okay, mm -hmm. they were the first school within within before they completed ten years. They were in the Financial Times top twenty rankings. So in that sense, you could say they are even more successful than CIBS because within the first 10 years, they broke into the top 20 of the FT rankings. Today, they are the highest ranked Indian school in the FT rankings. And you know that the AICT has tried to shut them down many times. Mm -hmm. They've written letters to the chief minister, formerly of Andhra Pradesh and of Telangana, saying that this school is not allowed to, and they are, they are forced to charge GST because they're not considered an, an academic institution because they don't have the AICT certification. But they have this, the three biggest certifications in the world. The Association to Advanced Collegiate Schools of Business, the AACS, which is the American certification, the European certification, which is EQUIS, and mm -hmm. the AMBA, which is the British certification, right? In contrast, in China, the Chinese government has encouraged all the public universities in China to acquire international certification. Correct. You see the mindset. Right? The mindsets are completely different, right? That's changing very slowly now, okay? But uh, we still have a long way to go. I mean, we did the economic reforms in 1991, but I think we need a mindset reform. You know, we need to, you know, open ourselves much more to, to, to knowledge from outside, outside the country, right? And, uh, and benchmark ourselves Your against the, to the world. Exactly. Your friend, your friend, dear friend, Jayan Shikhande AG also echoes the same sentiment when he says that Professor Rama, it is a mindset in India, which is the main problem. Uh, he was, of course, referring to why our manufacturing is not growing, but that's also what you have said. 
your other good friend shrikant uh, aradhya has asked you a question i think that has been covered i'll just quickly read it can you compare the successes in china and india in terms of manufacturing startups and innovations and the factors leading to these successes uh, i think you've covered that but is there something that you would also like to add uh, to what you just, I just wanted to i mean i i i strongly encourage you to read uh, a book that was written by my colleague mm -hmm. uh, it's called the fortune makers okay and i just want to show you uh, it's based on 72 interviews 72 wow. interviews and some of the people that he interviewed uh, so, um, he interviewed every the who's who of uh, mm -hmm. of chinese industry liu chuang chuanjie the founder of uh, lenovo jack ma the founder of the midea group right correct uh, um, new soft uh, new hope the new oriental so uh, wangke uh, mindray which is the largest uh, medical equipment manufacturer in china and you see some of their revenues media group uh, 39 40 billion us dollars market cap of nearly 70 billion us dollars they make home appliances i think you you know that right so these are the successes right and and so he it is their leadership right so he talks about the six things that make the chinese leaders different from western leaders right mm -hmm. and learning for them is very 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 important they're constantly yeah. constantly constantly looking to at new ways to acquire knowledge to improve not just their companies but themselves and if uh, if you're going to make an investment in a book i would suggest that you invest in this book uh, it's available on on amazon um, if you're interested in getting if you can't get hold of the amazon uh, site in china i can arrange for english copies of this book to be delivered to you at any at any place of your choosing uh, but it's it's a wonderful book and i think it's very eye opening right they talk about in what ways the chinese ceos are different from us ceos and indian ceos right so one one very important thing that they do is they invest a lot more in the a lot more time in building their management teams and in nurturing the corporate culture mm -hmm. uh, exactly yeah so i think uh, you know this basically uh, this, the, the desire for scale the desire for learning um, you know continuously improving uh, all the time whether it's manufacturing whether it's sales whether it's uh, you know, operations, whether it's uh, technology, uh, these are uh, you know, very, very stellar characteristics of the Chinese uh, CEOs. Professor Rama, hey. could you share the name of the author uh, for the benefit of all the friends? Yeah, uh, so it's, it's, it has multiple authors, so I'll, I'll just share it immediately on the, on the chat. You can share it on the group, yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And so, also, yeah. The, also the picture of the book, so that we'll definitely go for it and, and try to get that. Yeah, I'll I'll share the picture later on. But for Michael Uzim, uh, Harbir Singh is one of the one of the uh, co-authors, uh, who's a Wharton professor, Peter Capelli. But the but the interviews were done by my colleague Liang Nan. He's a he's a, uh -huh. a, a professor emer emeritus at my school. He just retired, uh, senior professor. And uh, the title of the book is The Fortune Makers. Fortune Makers. Okay. Excellent. Like, Prof okay. Professor Rama, we are we are at the last couple of minutes. We are at uh, an hour and fifteen minutes, and and we really don't want to drag you uh, more. But there is, I think, let's take one last question, uh, and then we can. This comes from again another very dear friend of yours, Jagdish Acharya ji, and he's saying, "What is the different? Uh, what is the difference in the Israeli context that makes it a great hub for innovation and startups?" I think that's a that's a that's an interesting question probably to end and then of course my request to all the friends is I I will of course post all your questions to Professor Rama but please feel free to also connect with him directly I mean we we the good thing is we all know him we all know him dearly so feel free to connect with him as well. Uh, I have personally never been to Israel uh, and <laughs> one of my one of my one of my uh, goals is to is to go there. Um, but I can tell you what my colleagues have said who visited there. And I think the, basically it is, um, uh, you know, the Jewish culture also places a tremendous uh, amount of importance on learning. 
Uh -huh. uh, Israel has uh, some really, really top-notch uh, universities like Technion and so on. Um, uh, Tel Aviv University, Technion, they've produced uh, Nobel laureates, they've produced the breakthrough, you know, uh, whether it's in economics or in other areas, they produce some really great uh, scholars. And, um, uh, you know, if you look at the list of Nobel laureates, uh, many, many of them are actually of Jewish origin, right? So they are culturally, they are uh -huh. very, very attuned to, to, to learning all the time. Um, that's one. The second thing is, I think, um, the huge um, uh, defense support so, so one of the things that people don't realize is that, for example, uh, one of the key reasons why the United States is so uh, innovative is that a lot of the innovations actually come from defense investments. Okay, uh, the internet actually is an outcome of uh, a project within an agency called DARPA, you know, Defense mm -hmm. Advanced Research Projects Agency. Uh, okay. RFID came out of a defense lab. Okay, I so see. lots of the lots of the breakthrough innovations in in the US have actually come from from defense investment, and so there's a very close collaboration between uh, Israel and the United States on defense, uh, mm -hmm. and so a lot of that uh, investment gets translated into commercial innovation, spills over into into the commercial area. Okay. Uh, I think that's the second thing. And the third thing I think is that they have a very small market. And so what they try and do is they, they build the innovation in Israel and then they try and scale it in the United States. So I think that's, that's the other thing. That, that's important. Yeah. that is, that is excellent. I think this was, this was truly an insightful session. Uh, and Professor Rama, I'm sure you and all of us would like to definitely hear from our, uh, one of our mentors, one of, uh, at least one of my gurus, uh, Nandu. Uh, to say a few words and also to say a, a short vote of thanks. Uh, so, uh, Samir, if I can request you to unmute uh, Nandu, and if I can request Nandu to just uh, say a few words, uh, Nandu, you are of course a mentor to a lot of people, uh, and it'll be great to hear your views about this about today's session. I'm trying to unmute him, <clears throat> Nandu. You you had to unmute sure. yourself. Yeah. I think he's having some difficulty. He probably is not responding. All right. Okay. No, he, yeah, he, am he, I unmuted? Okay. Am I okay? Yes, 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 yes. You're yes, okay. yes, Nandu. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hey, uh, uh, Rama, this was a truly insightful session. Very, very well. Uh, we have, uh, uh, very well. I think it was the topics were very interesting, very apt, and very relevant. I think we need to have more sessions from you, Rama, because there's so much of learning because of your teaching in Spain, teaching in. Uh, China and your visiting professorship, several great institutes in India as well. I think I learned a lot myself. And uh, I think Rama, one-on-one -on -one interactions that I've had with you in China, uh, I think I've learned. I think the, I can't forget those. And uh, Rama is such a helpful person, as he rightly said, he's going to get you, he will be able to get us uh, uh, articles from uh, Harvard Business School. And then talk. I think we all need to remain in touch with Rama, Professor Rama. We are actually privileged to have that kind of an association with him. And I think we can upgrade and update ourselves on a regular basis with him. So it's, it's great, Rama. Thank you so much. And you really covered excellent uh, topics. And I think we have more questions that, were, that remained answered just because of the time uh, uh, limitations. But I think uh, we may be able to cover more in your next session. Thank you so much. And Amit and Brad, well done. And thanks. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Professor yeah. Rama. Wishing everybody a lovely, uh, uh, lovely evening. Uh, more importantly, a lot of good health, uh, good, strong immunity. Stay safe and let's stay mentally and physically healthy. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.